come out and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm glad you could too because I feel this is an important topic. I think all speakers probably do feel that their topics are important, but I think this is important in the broader sense. Uh, I'm also glad I could make it. I just visited the locksmith village for some time and I was stuck in the handcuffs, but I, I was eventually able to work my way out and come here in time. So, um, so glad I could do that. I, I'd kind of like to say that thing that sometimes we like to say about how I threw this together at the last minute just so I can um, maybe excuse any typos or anything else, but the reality is I put this together over a long period of time because I think it's important and I think it's an important thing that we need to talk about because really we're talking about the knowledge that exists in rooms like this and how it can be and often is not applied to different uh, tasks and different functions. So I would like to start with saying that this is kind of a difficult topic to talk about for some, and I understand that, for literally millions of people in the United States alone, uh, this is something that kind of uh, strikes close to home. So I took great care to avoid any triggering imagery or specific uh, verbiage, but at the same time, if I say anything or if anything comes up that maybe is affecting someone, uh, they're very much free to step out that won't hurt my feelings or just concentrate on their phone or even say something if you feel that I'm off base or have something that you want to contribute at any point. I'm always eager to have a conversation. Um, okay, that being said, this is me. I'm Chris Cox. Um, I'm the founder and past president of the Operations Security Professionals Association, a nonprofit organization that focuses on OPSEC awareness, training within different sectors. Uh, I'm also the executive director of the offshoot of that, which came from that organization, called Operation Safe Escape. And Operation Safe Escape is also a nonprofit organization that uh, helps provide security awareness, knowledge, tools, resources, uh, training, consulting, all that stuff, all for free to help combat domestic violence uh, in the United States and for other countries as well. So what we do is we really work with different organizations and individuals and kind of help to um, provide that security layer that's really missing in a lot of cases, which I'll cover a little bit later. We have been a part of 2,000 successful escapes, which I'm very, very proud of, and every time we've gotten involved, it has been successful. Knock on anything you have that's wood. I'd appreciate that. Uh, I would like to say, I like actually, I can do that. Uh, th I chose that picture because I don't photograph well, and that's the last good picture that I took. <laughs> that's about the time that I think I peaked, so I've been liking to use that picture as much as possible. You probably can't see it on the screens, but that's me beating zombies ate my neighbors on my uh, old style CRT TV, on my Nintendo with my Game Genie, using wearing my Garfield t-shirt in front of my Spider-Man collection. So that was when I peaked, that's the, thank you. <laughs> that was the coolest I ever got, and so uh, that is where I'm frozen in time. Um, so really what we're talking about are how common security models tend to fail predictably reliably and consistently when applied to a specific problem set. And so if something happens predictably, reliably, consistently, and everything else, it's definitely something that we have to start exploring and figure out why that happens. If it's something that we can see happens in a, I would say nearly 100% of certain cases, then that's something that we need to try to figure out why and need to figure out what we collectively can do about it. And I'd like to illustrate that point, but I need a volunteer to do that. Oh, don't be shy. Well, gentleman in the red dish. Yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, coming up. I'm sorry. What is that? Someone, someone probably knows that color. Red, mauve. Oh, I heard maroon most clearly, so I'll stick with that. Gentleman in the maroon shirt. Uh, what is your name? Aaron. Aaron. This is Aaron. Uh, can you confirm that we have never met before? That is correct. Okay. Well, thank you, Aaron, for coming up. I appreciate Definitely. that. Because I'm going to do something really amazing. I'm going to do something that will blow your mind and uh, kind of uh, make me a legend at to this particular conference. Within no less, no more, within three tries, I'm going to, see now you don't know what you got into, this could be a bad thing, but you came up anyways. Within exactly, within three tries, I'm going to determine your private email password. Okay. Okay, he says, a brave guy. And so the wager is, is that if I can do it, then we're going to blow off the rest of the talk and bring up the internet browser and spend the next 50 minutes looking through his private emails. Um, yeah, see now he's like, maybe it's too late to change my mind. But if I can't do it, then you win a prize. All right. So there, there's, a, there's a wager there. Okay, so um, I'm going to, however, I have trouble keeping count. So I have three tries. If you guys can keep track for me, make sure I don't go over, make sure I don't cheat. Fair? 
Fair, okay. So try number one to determine Eric's, Aaron, Aaron close enough, uh, to determine his uh, email, private email password. Please give me your email password. <laughs> I'm gonna say no to that one. Okay, okay. He said no if you couldn't hear him. You can speak here, oh. please, we can hear you. I, I'm gonna All say right. no to that one, there you go. Uh, so okay, so that was like a practice one. Yeah. So I still have three, three tries. Um, no, okay, two. Two tries. But that's okay because we're just getting warmed up and I can definitely escalate the way that I, uh, that I try to do this. So I have other tools in my bag. Pretty please give me your email password. Still no. Okay. He's a tough nut to crack. I didn't expect uh, this level of resistance. But uh, that's okay. That's okay. We, can, uh, we still have some opportunities available. I still have how many tries? Oh, one. I'm down to my last one. Okay, I better make this count. Pretty please give me your email password with a cherry on top. Okay, in that case, it's trust no with a one after. No, still not. <laughs> he, and he even lied to me about it. That's, that's the worst part. Um, okay, well, I, I didn't expect that. I kind of thought that I'd be successful, but apparently I failed. You do win a prize, uh, an actual prize, so that is for so, you. Okay. Thank well, you thank, you for, thank you for playing our game. And... Um, Thank you for humiliating me in front of all these people. So I am, uh, I am shocked that that didn't work. Or am I? <laughs> uh, no, I'm actually not shocked because I had no leverage over Aaron or Eric or whatever he calls himself. Um, but I had no re he had no reason to give up that information. Um, I, he's a big guy. He looks kind of tough, so I couldn't uh, force him to give it to me. I have no legal authority to get it over uh, out of him. So. All I could do was to try to convince him, and I failed to do that despite my best efforts. I asked really nicely, um, so I'm a little bit surprised he said no. But um, he didn't have a reason to give it to me, and that's not an option that everybody has in that case, and we're going to really explore that a little bit later. So you may have seen this before. This is a cautionary model. We call it the M&M model, the candy model, or something like that. You may be familiar, but kind of the concept is that if you have a hard outer perimeter and a gooey inner center, uh, number one, that's delicious, but number two, it's not a good security model. And so what you have is you have a situation where you may be fairly secure from the outside, but if that perimeter is cracked of the candy model, if it's cracked, then the candy loses the ability to protect against uh, predators and attract mates. I think I'm actually talking about turtles at that point. I'm bad with metaphors. But uh, the, the concept applies is that you really want to have a hard shell, whatever it is. But at the same time, if you are vulnerable on the inside of your network or your perimeter or whatever it is, then you're going to have a bad time. Um, it can actually work in a lot of cases. If you work on securing your perimeter and you're positive that all of your threats are external, and that you're never going to do anything that you shouldn't do, and that no one's in your network that's going to do anything they shouldn't do, then okay, you can, you can focus on your perimeter, you'll probably be okay. And that's kind of the way that a lot of us, uh, a lot of people in general, on their home networks, or on sometimes their work networks, or whatever they may have, really focus on. And we all know there's fundamental flaws in that. Uh, especially if you didn't buy the bag of candy, which I'm not sure if that's a metaphor that works, but I think you all get the point of what I'm saying. So if you don't actually own the devices, if you don't actually have control over it, then you're even less able to defend not only your perimeter, but also the inside level as well. So I'd like to throw out, and I was going to ask some questions. I, don't, I ran out of Raspberry Pis. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I can't really uh, reward those. But what is it, just throw out some answers, that protects our data? Like what can we rely on to stay safe? Anyone? Like what? A VPN? So yeah, protect our, uh, our in transit, is that it? Crypto, crypto. yeah. Uh, crypto, you mean cryptocurrency, is that what? No, <laughs> kidding, kidding. Uh, yeah, crypto, uh, that's good, shout it out, anything else? Two-factor two authentication, good, good. There's a lot, I mean, here's a few that I came up with. Uh, we have, in certain cases, constitutional rights uh, to having our data protected. Um, unless you're crossing borders, then it comes a little uh, funky in that case. Uh, encryption, passwords, physical locks, guards, various privacy laws, biometrics. There's a lot of stuff that we, that we in this room especially tend to apply to our networks. That's probably why my computer's so slow. I log in, there's multiple layers, there's other things that I need to do because I tend to overprotect 
uh, a bad habit, but I see something shiny and new and want to try it. But um, what this talk's really going to focus on is that in a lot of cases, kind of germane to the point of this talk, is that when someone is a victim of certain forms of abuse, or someone is, when the attacker is close to the victim, then they have less protections than we may assume are available. Uh, so really in a lot of cases, you have the hope that the attacker isn't going to look very closely, or if they do, they're not going to know what they're seeing, or you might have the cleverness of the defenses, so maybe it can withstand some level of scrutiny. Neither of those are good to rely on. Neither of those are sufficient when it comes to actually protecting someone's information, particularly when I think about the information that I want to protect. There's not, I mean, I don't have much um, that is really for me a, a matter of personal safety uh, if it were discovered. A lot of embarrassment. You go through my browser history and I will be humiliated. But um, for a lot of people, it's much more serious than that. So we'll kind of explore that in the presentation, what happens when proximity is a factor. Speaking of which, uh, as far as a few things that I consider to be facts, is that security largely generally relies on both secrecy and access to establish permission to a resource. So what that means is that you have to have the ability to keep a secret, and you have to have the ability to configure the system to use that secret. So you consider a password. Uh, a password is something that you generally keep secret. Uh, you memorize it, you put it in your head, or you put it on a post-it note on your keyboard, whichever works for you, I'm not here to judge. But you have to have the ability to both establish that secret that other people can't get to, or at least the people you don't want to, and then you have to actually have the ability to securely install that on your system while negating other, uh, other potential openings. However, secrecy and access can be overcome by proximity. In other words, that's both physical proximity and that's both technical proximity. So the closer the attacker gets to the victim themselves, then the less ability they have to maintain that secrecy, especially but also the access that they would want to have, or excuse me, the, um, uh, the ability to install those. And then I think this is kind of a given, this is almost a uh, throwaway line, but it's true that a dedicated and persistent threat is more likely to be successful than a random attacker. So we're talking about like an APT in whatever sense you want to define it, whether it's a group or a malware strain or however else you want to use the word. Um, it's more likely that someone that wants you and your information is going to be successful than a random skitty that's just kind of you know, going across the network. They're going to look for whatever open doors they can find. They're not going to be as dedicated to your information. And then what's known, like a password or something else, can be discovered, at least we'll say theoretically, where th whether it be force, coercion, legal, or stealth, there's, a couple, there's many, many different ways that the things that you know in your head, like a password, for example, can be actually determined and used against you. So with that being said, to get to the point of the conversation, does anyone here actually make something like websites or software or apps? Anyone create things? Okay, a, lot of, a lot of folks make things that other people will use. And I will make the assumption that when you're making these things that other people use, that you're at least keeping in mind some form of security for that user. However, then at that point we have to keep in mind something that we collectively tend to neglect or forget is that statistically, so this is wildly unscientific for your sample size and your user group and whatever else, but statistically across the, uh, across the nation, one in four women and one in seven men will be the victim of intimate partner violence at some point in their life. That doesn't only include the, forms, the kinetic forms of violence, but that number also rolls up certain forms of control and other forms of abuse. So I think it'd be reasonable to say that those one in four women, one in seven men, have very unique security requirements and needs that are very, very often not met or considered. So it's important to kind of change our mindset and keep that user base in mind. In fact, that number is mind-bogglingly huge. We're talking about six million men and women a year that are impacted by some form of abuse, whether it's control, physical violence, or anything else. We're talking about one in six women and one in, one in 19 men suffer from what would be categorized as extreme stalking. And that's like the Hallmark Movie Channel level of stalking, which is just, I'm sorry? Lifetime. Lifetime, I'm sorry, Hallmark. Hallmark's like the Christmas stuff, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> I need to watch more TV, I won't embarrass myself, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, so that's like the Lifetime uh, movie channel stuff, which is actually disturbingly accurate in a lot of cases. It seems really kind of played up. Uh, a lot of cases it is. 
But in reality, a lot of things that you see that seem fictionalized and exaggerated are things that actually happen and things that uh, we have an opportunity to work with individuals on. And 25% of dating teens, so teenagers that are active in the dating social world, uh, have been at some point harassed by a partner. Uh, teens, what we would consider teens in this day and age, are what you call at least digital natives. A lot of what they do is online, and that also equates to forms of harassment. We're talking about social networking, we're talking about hacking into accounts. Uh, a lot of teens don't have that security savvy that the brain trust in this room maintains. So passwords might be an afterthought, and it's not that hard for a partner, uh, for a dating teen, to be able to determine some of those passwords and accounts because they're able to overcome secrecy and, and uh, access. So. There we go. Uh, so as I said, six million is a mind-bogglingly large number. It's difficult to figure what six million people look like. So we're going to talk about one here. Uh, Anna is a real person that has allowed us to share her story. Uh, Anna is not her real name, but it's the name that she chose to be represented by. But her story is very real. Uh, now I prefer, I like pictures, but in this case, for obvious reasons, I am not using a picture. But if you were to see Anna, you would be surprised by how normal and uh, a regular person she appears. She's just any random person, does not look like someone that if you have a perception of what a victim of abuse might look like, is not someone that would make perhaps fall in that perception. Because Anna is a regular human being that ended up in a very, very dangerous and a very, very bad situation. So, and I'm certainly not going to use a stock photo model to represent her either. So you'll have to just kind of use your imagination for Anna. So she was married to her husband for three years. The abuse began after one. And at that point, it was not physical violence, but it started off, as abuse often does, with control, with isolation. And that's kind of the corner mark, as we'll see a little bit later, of what abuse becomes. And technology has enabled it a little bit. So she wasn't allowed, not discouraged, but she wasn't allowed to hide her, have her own passwords or her pins. That was something that wasn't permitted. Uh, if she did try to have passwords that were her own, there were various repercussions that she'd suffer, so it wasn't worth it to her to, uh, to suffer those in exchange for that uh, amount of privacy. Her phone was checked regularly, looking for text messages, looking for emails, looking for new apps and everything else, so it was scrutinized. And um, unsurprisingly, that didn't go both ways. So her phone was allowed to be looked at, uh, her passwords had to be given up, but that did not go the same way for her partner, who was able to have, he had the right, if you will, the permission uh, to have that level of secrecy in his own home, whereas she did not. And uh, over time, the other forms of abuse did kind of escalate as well. So after that three-year point, uh, thank God she did make it out. She made it out safely. But at that point, the infrastructure was already in place because for those first three years, there were things that were put in place. He had her passwords for that amount of time. He still had them. Uh, he had other ways of getting access to her network and to her accounts and her information. He knew, as we had talked about in the title, he knew her mother's maiden name, so password resets were not a, not, were not a problem. And there were a lot of things where he had the technological advantage over Anna because he knew the security concepts, uh, whereas she did not. She didn't have that, uh, the benefit of some of that knowledge. So education became a really important part. So at the time where we began talking to Anna, in helping her sort through some of those things. Uh, throughout that time period, 16 of her online accounts were fully compromised. Uh, that's including her email accounts, her health accounts, um, other things such as that. And so he was in them, he was able to read her emails and she knew it and he made it very clear that, that he was there as well. But the advice that she got, she would do the right thing and go to law enforcement. And this is where we have kind of a mismatch in information and knowledge. Law enforcement would say predictably the thing that we'd expect law enforcement to say, change your password. Uh, oftentimes the local police offices don't know things about two-factor authentication. And once again, there's a big education piece in terms of trying to push that knowledge to them. So change your phone number, change your password, you'll be fine. She comes back and says, I did that nine times. What do you want me to do next? So she wasn't getting help there. Uh, we did find two unknown devices on her network, so conceivably drop boxes or something else that was connected that we were able to get rid of, but not physically find. And that's always frustrating for me, because I don't know what they actually were, but they were connected in some way. Uh, there were email redirects, so everything that she was getting on some of her email accounts were going to him as well, so he knew kind of where she'd be, and everything else. Um, he took the um, initiative in terms of poisoning the well when she moved. He found out where she was, because he was in her email. And so he knew also what industry she worked in. So he took the initiative to poison the well, if you will, with potential employers 
and to say, it, through various means, and say, you shouldn't hire this person because of various reasons, which was bad. And at some point within those three years, uh, stalkerware, like actual stalkerware, was installed on her phone, which she didn't know about it. It was there for a long time. So it was using, I think, MySpy was the variant he was using. I mean, you pay 60 bucks, and it's not that hard. He didn't have a great skill level, but he had 60 bucks, and he had access. And so he was able to actually do this. So we started closing down these things. We started helping her recover, uh, enabling different security methods, and that, that, that pissed him off. Uh, so first thing he did is he got into her DVR and deleted all her favorite shows. Uh, I mean, how petty can you get? Uh, he actually, he, he knew it. What's that? Hold his beer. Hold. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, right. He, could, he, I'm, she, he did. Yeah, he got more petty and ridiculous. But, I mean, he knew what she, she liked. He knew, what she, he knew her well because he was close to her for a very long period of time. And so he leveraged what he knew in order to further the attack. Uh, Mike is another good example. He was married for six years. And uh, there was a lot of kind of subtle manipulation, in, in his case, from a significant other, which was saying that you shouldn't need uh, passwords. It's not, that I'm, it's not that he's telling Mike that you can't have uh, private passwords and pins and things like that. But if you have nothing to hide, then why do you need it? Why can't you share it with me? What are you hiding? And so what that meant is that his significant other was able to gain full access to all of his information and everything else. Once again, did not cut both ways, but at a certain point you can't really ask that question. Uh, phone tracking apps were overtly installed so we know where each other is at all times, can stay safe. But at the same time, significant other did not like his friends. So he was discouraged, he was slowly cut off from that, which meant that his support system eroded over time. And his significant other would know when he was with one of his friends. And so when the abuse turned physical, he already had lost his support system. And that was intentional. That was part of the process, which kind of exists here. So abuse tends to follow what's called the power and control wheel. And it's modified here because the power and control wheel, as it exists, uh, has, I'll just say, some flaws in it or some issues that need to be, have, it needs to be updated, I'd say. For one thing, it's very kinetic focused and doesn't really understand the technology piece as it relates to abuse. So I modified it a little bit, added some technology stuff. But you tend to see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different kinds of categories is what you see. You see intimidation, which is trying to make the person afraid. Uh, trying to destroy items. This is where they start to do acts of violence against pets, um, against the individual, really kind of making a demonstration of uh, the fact they're not safe. Uh, emotional, you get your insults, you get gaslighting, you're crazy and everything else. Isolation is a big one where they're controlling who they can't see. Often it's for your own good to make sure you don't hang out with a bad crowd. Uh, minimizing, destroying, uh, and denying and uh, shifting blame, using the children to relay messages or to manipulate the children or the individual knows I can't leave or I lose my kids and various things that traps a lot of people in a bad situation, which is, is horrible. Uh, using privilege of various types, uh, you see this a lot with immigration status where if you leave me, you're getting deported and I know you don't want that. Or enforcing traditional roles or making all the decisions. Economic is a big one where if the individual is isolated and controlled, they might lose their job skills, lose their relevancy in the workplace, so unable to continue in that regard. And coercion and threats, and that goes both ways. If you leave me, I'll kill myself. If you leave me, I'll kill you. Uh, pets, whatever else the case may be, or from a technical perspective, uh, I have your information. Remember those pictures that we took. If you leave me, they get out. Highly illegal, but uh, oftentimes hard to prove. And oftentimes, uh, the fear of that enough is uh, enough to delay the person's decision. And so what we tend to see is with the tech piece, uh, from, a, from a technical security information type piece, we tend to see that in five of them. That worked. I'm great. Uh, that's great. You tend to see that with intimidation, using tech to intimidate the individual, to leverage emotional attacks, to isolate them, to use forms of privilege, uh, this, in this case, in the very literal sense and then in economic attacks as well. So we're going to go ahead and explore those uh, five and see kind of how that happens. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen in the other arenas as well. Uh, abusers are often very, very creative with the ways that they will leverage their abuse and find new and uh, terrible ways to do it. But this is where we tend to see it most often for the victims and the survivors that we work with, both as they're planning their escape and as they're recovering from the abuse in a safe place. So intimidation is a big one. Intimidation is one of the most uh, obvious and overt, and it's designed to be. It's designed to say, it's not, they don't want to be subtle. They want the victim to know that they're there. They want them to know that they're still there, 
and that they are going to continue to be there is the impression they want to leverage. Because attribution is not easy. If any of you uh, are surprised by that, I'd be surprised by that. But um, in our daily world, as we know, it's, it can be difficult to say, yes, this is the source of the attacker. Uh, so we kind of take what clues we can and try to make a best guess. But that can be really, really hard when the resources aren't available to do that. Uh, you may have more resources in your workplace or in your professional life, but when you're talking about the local police department and overworked and often out of work at the moment, federal workforce, uh, or other things like that, it really slows things down. And that's relevant because sometimes we do work with federal law enforcement for various things, and there's a, a backlog. There's actually, it's, it's more difficult to get assistance right now because of the lack of, avail of availability. So they'll skate that fine line between saying, yes, I'm here, I want you to know that it's me, and right before, up to the point of, I want you to be able to prove that it's me. So they're in that kind of, that spot between we know it's them and we can prove it's them and they'll try to stay there for as long as possible. So as a good example, we recently had this happen with a young lady we we're working with uh, elsewhere, where her abuser um, first thing took out her security cameras, so in the interim between when her security cameras could be restored, um, he broke into her house and put a bunch of listening devices all over the place. And I'm talking about dozens of them, <clears throat> excuse me, dozens of listening devices and they were placed very overtly. They were plugged into wall outlets, they were left on shelves. They were designed to be found. And I, I hope that we found all of them. It could have been distractions and there are some that are still hidden. But the goal, the primary goal of having so many available wasn't to actually listen in on her conversations for those devices. She walks into the front door, there's a listening device practically saying, hello, I'm here. Um, it was designed so that she couldn't feel safe in her home. That was the goal of hiding those, or not hiding those, was to say, I'm listening to you. I can get in any time that I want to. And you can't talk freely to your children or your friends while inside your own home. And if you can't feel safe in your home, as she hadn't for a very long time for different reasons, then that's an effective form of abuse and a very psychologically damaging one. So the goal is to say, you can't get rid of me no matter what, no matter what you try to do. I'm still here and I'm going to stay here. Uh, it's hacking into accounts, but not really. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of making it look like they are or to do it in a way that, that it's clear that that's what's going on. Uh, being very obvious, being, uh, monitoring what they're doing, putting in two factor, uh, making sure the person gets their two-factor authentication notifications. They don't want to break in. They don't have the person's phone number, but they want the person to see, oh, it's, they're trying again. I got an alert. Wake him up in the middle of the night because you get a phone alert. It's all these subtle forms of abuse as well. Or locking out accounts is another one. So you keep trying the password. If it has a lockout, something that person can't get into their bank or can't get into their email or whatever else the case may be. Uh, emotional is very, very similar to the other step where the goal is to wear down the individual and uh, make them feel like they're everywhere. And you tend to see that kind of the paranoia increases, which is also isolating as well, because the friends, they're like, I don't want a piece of this. I don't want to be involved in this. You're crazy. They're not everywhere. That can be really difficult when the person's seeking qualified technical help, where they say, uh, I, I did have the privilege of talking to one individual. I said, okay, you're concerned. First, uh, first thing when you go back to your school, sit on a random computer. Don't tell me what it is. Get on this random email account, and, and you, we can message that way. And they said, well, no, once I sit down, he'll hack into it. Um, that's what they truly believed. They truly believed that the moment they sat down to any random computer that their attacker would know about it because that's the message that he conveyed after a long period of time. So they may add traces, make it very over clear that that's what they're doing, and then change it back if they have that level of access before they can ask for help. So when they say, hey, I'm at a computer shop, this is what I'm seeing, and there's nothing there. So that's a kind of a form of gaslighting where both making the individual feel that they're crazy and those around them feel that they're crazy. And I use crazy in a non-perjurative term. I use that in the sense that that is the goal that they want that person to feel that way. Uh, you also see um, various things that will be, once again, uh, designed to wear down the individual. Does anyone know Clark's third law of technology? Arthur C. Clark, the, the science fiction author? I see some north and south there. But basically what Clark had said is that um, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, that the more advanced the technology, the more it looks like magic. And that's relative. I would suggest that's relative. Because sufficiently advanced technology to you may be very different to significantly advanced technology for my grandmother, who may not understand what the technology can and can't do. There's a recent tweet, and I forget who tweeted it, 
if it's someone here, thank you, because I got a good laugh. But they talked about how their dishwasher uh, chimed and opened up on its own, and uh, that if they didn't know better, they would think it's ghosts or something like that. And that's funny, because we know what IoT type devices are. We know why, how it connects to the network and everything else. I don't really know fully why my dishwa dishwashers and my washer and dryer connect to the internet, but they do, and that's okay. But if you didn't know that it was going to do that, and suddenly your dishwasher was opening up, and you're trying to explain that to someone who also doesn't know, and you said, my dishwasher opened up, I think it's my abuser, um, that's going to be wearing on an emotional level. Same with lights. Lights go up and down, um, dim a little bit. You start to kind of wonder, am I seeing this? Is this real? Or, or were they right? Am I, am I losing my mind? I don't know if you saw it recently, but New York Times, uh, several months, maybe a year back, I don't know, did an interview with uh, Eva Galperin uh, from EFF all about how IoT devices can be used to further attacks. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. It's very, very interesting, uh, very, very enlightening. But it can. There's a lot of different ways where if the abuser once had access, they will maintain that level of access because they're advanced, persistent, and th a threat, and to try to continue to leverage it any way they can. And IoT devices are becoming more and more common. They're becoming more and more, they're becoming easier to uh, install. You can get on the Wish app and you can buy an IoT thermometer, uh, um, thermostat from China for like 10 bucks uh, if you desire to do that, but <laughs> I don't recommend it. There we go. Uh, isolation is another big one. Isolation is I would call the cornerstone of abuse. It's often where it begins. The goal is to remove and restrict the person from their support system, from their family, and from their friends so that uh, when the abuse changes nature, they don't have someone to turn to, they don't have that sanity check. So for a person to say, no, this is wrong, they become dependent on the individual. So someone who is perpetrating abuse, that is often their first goal, is to isolate their victim. So if you think about a person that is isolated by default anyways, so they may be in a rural area, they may be not allowed to leave their home, they may be locked inside their home. The technology that they have access to is their lifeline in a literal sense. So it's their only connection to the outside world. So if they have a computer, they can talk to family and friends. If they have a phone, they can talk to family and friends. That is undesirable from the abuser's perspective. So their goal becomes to how to restrict that. Um, so versus television, which is kind of a one-way feed, and that's often okay or permitted. So with that technology that they have being their contact with the outside world, the abuser will take that away from them in various ways. So such as, in some cases, just literally taking the phone as a punishment uh, when they do something quote unquote wrong, and I can't use air quotes enough for that, then they'll just take the phone with them to work so that the victim is left alone, locked in the house, in the middle of the woods, whatever the case may be, and unable to really communicate elsewise. So it's a matter of controlling access to devices, Sometimes it's impersonating the victim, which is really easy to do in this day and age to make spoof uh, social networking accounts. Uh, I see some friendly faces in this room that I know very well that are very, very good at the social engineering aspect uh, and able to kind of um, understand what a threat that is and how easy it can be for a bad actor to do the same thing. So it's also a matter of locking out accounts too, especially email and social networking to say you can't access this because I'm not permitting it. And then privilege, in this case, we're talking about literally administrative privileges from, this, uh, from the perspective of this conversation. Um, so it's a matter of preventing the individual from doing things that they would want to do on their own. So, for example, parental control software on phones or on uh, computers, net nanny type things to say you can't communicate between these hours or go to these websites or everything else. Often, once again, for your own good is the justification given that I don't want you to get viruses or whatever the case may be. But in reality, it's much more malicious than that. Um, setting router access levels to only times when the abuser may be home so that the individual is unable to really talk freely either on the phone or on the computer or whatever else the case may be uh, without risk of the abuser determining what they're doing. So it's uh, preventing changes that can overcome that isolation aspect, so installing new apps that can be restricted and not only for shared devices, but the ones that are wholly owned by the victim as well as kind of a target. Uh, and also, of course, you can prevent wiping of the logs so that you can, the abuser can go back and see who they've been talking to or what they've been doing. Another one, I think the last in the group, is economic abuse as well. A big piece of that is th this is kind of a 
we saw this in the case study where the, uh, the goal of this phase or this aspect is to impact the person's independence and their ability to provide for themselves, either during the cycle of abuse, so that they're dependent on the income of the attacker or the abuser, or afterwards as well as a form of punishment to say, well, you left and you're going to suffer for that. So what we tend to see is interfering with the job hunt. We did see that in the case of Anna, who her abuser slash attacker went ahead and poisoned the well, uh, put in false applications and things like that, and uh, just made it so it's very, very difficult to, for her to move on with her life. And IoT attacks is becoming increasingly common. A lot of things the individual doesn't understand why their uh, heating bill is going up, but in reality it's because their um, thermostat is kicking off at a lot of different times, which has the side effect of making their pets uncomfortable, which is also often a target. And then you have what I like to call the kind of technical methods, not really technical methods, but they're accompanying it. So such as crowdsourcing the abuse, which is often we see that with doxing, which is, hey, here's this person's information, here's some embarrassing pictures of them, and here's this really, really bad thing that they did so we should all be mad at them and attack them with the information that I've given you. It's really easy to get the internet spun up on a witch hunt, right? Where, you know, you can give this sob story, you can give this information, and just let other people do the attack for you. And in that case, if the initial message can't be traced back to the attacker, they're kind of safe in the, they're, they're kind of lost in the shuffle there. You remember uh, low orbit ion cannon, low, low I, LOIC? which was dependent entirely on that. Is that. There's so many people attacking at one time, it's difficult to figure out where it's coming from or who orchestrated it. Another one I like to call police as a service, or a pass, um, which is using police officers and law enforcement to further enable or even legitimize the abuse, where the attacker, the abuser, can find different ways to use the police to harass their victim further in a way that is generally wholly legal to do. And, of course, that puts the person on the, what they perceive to be on the bad side of the law, creates mistrust between law enforcement. It's a golden opportunity for someone to do bad things to good people. So an example is a fiancé, boyfriend, girlfriend that has a cell phone that is technically paid for by the abuser. Uh, so it's technically not theirs, but there's been a circumstance situation where it's been paid for by the person that wants to leverage this sort of attack. And so rather than deal with it like a normal human being, like an adult, and say, hey, I'd like my phone back, or cancel the plan, or whatever else the case may be, they may report it as stolen and say, I don't know where it is, they ran off and they took my property, which kind of compels, in a lot of cases, law enforcement to act. Uh, that's not law enforcement's fault. They're, they, they're often aware that they're being used as a weapon, but obligated to act in certain ways. Uh, or often they're not aware that they're being used in such a way, uh, because it looks like just any other type of police report. There's also uh, perceived methods, which that accompanies that. So which are, I would say, methods that aren't directly caused by the attacker, but they're a byproduct of the other elements. So kind of naturally, when someone's going through such a thing, before they try to reach out for help or find out that there's help available, they may start to do research on their own. And without the necessary background to separate the wheat from the chaff, 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 something? Yeah. Wheat from the chaff. OK, thanks. Um, so th they may be stuck with thinking that certain things are true that aren't true. Perfect case in point is when my car starts making a funny noise, I get on DuckDuckGo or whatever else and I start looking up symptoms. And because I don't have the background in automotive technology, uh, I don't know what's normal and what's not. So I might start to uh, think that certain things are not normal or think that certain things are indicative of a problem where in fact if I talk to a mechanic they'd say, no, this is perfectly normal, you're fine. So one example is when something is technically accurate but very unlikely. So a perfect example is when a state actor has a capability. The individual reads this and says, oh, this technology, this capability exists, so maybe this is why I'm seeing what I'm seeing. This is maybe why my individual attacker is able to do the same thing. Maybe they can, whatever it is you see in the news that state actors can do, it'll be misattributed in that case. Or the WebMD model, where everything means something. Uh, so when I start looking at it because I have a hurt toe, and then an hour later I realize I have hysterical pregnancy, uh, it's because I'm not able to really figure out what is actually connected and why that applies. So um, you'll find something that's unrelated but similar enough that it can be lumped in with other symptoms. And then you have just too much information. You have TMI where it can be overwhelming, you're trying to figure out what might apply and what not, and that only increases the stress and the uncertainty for the individual, which causes them to further be subject to later attacks. So 
ideally secure communications. I didn't have a segue really here, so I'm just going to talk about it like I did, and I'll use the word segue so it sounds like I'm leading from one to the other. But ideally secure communications focuses on one side where you have the devices connected to oftentimes like a central access point of some sort. And then it goes across other people's computers called the internet and other things. And it eventually ends up at your target place where that should be secure from one end to the other. So ideally on the devices is secure, goes across the network in a secure manner and ends up where you want it to be. But we find very, very commonly for this particular use case for this particular set is you have one side that is very, very often attacked, which is the individual's devices, and that's where they have the fewest resources. Now, yes, they have the same resources that you and I have available for their systems. They can download the same tools, but it's a matter of being able to consistently apply them, which is where you tend to see problems. So you have that red area where it's attacked more and defended less, and that's where the abuse is going to focus. And then you have going across the network, which is rarely attacked in this case. I'm going to preface that it, for this use case it is rarely attacked by the abuser looking for the victim because they can't really hit that infrastructure in the same way. And it has ample resources that are pretty evenly applied. Uh, so when information's in transit. But then you have on the other side kind of a higher risk but not quite the highest risk where the targets they're trying to go to, their support systems, their resources, the information that they would need in order to plan their escape or to get help is, uh, has ample resources available but it's very unevenly applied. And so it's sometimes attacked. So there's kind of a um, different risk threat levels for those. And it tells you where you need to focus as well. So when you have those problems, like we just saw here, what you tend to do is that you want to fix those problems. So one thing that you do is you see a vulnerability and you develop a countermeasure. And that's kind of the knee-jerk reaction is, oh, I read about this type of attack. I know how to fix it. I'm going to patch my system. I'm good to go. And that's fine. You see a problem, you fix it. But in the real world, what you tend to see is that you have more than one vulnerability, and so then you have to kind of prioritize what you're going to focus on. And to do that, you take into account the means and the capabilities and the intent of the adversary. What are they actually going to try to do relative to me? In my own particular threat model, what is my adversary going to do so I know where to focus? Maybe they're not going to target this information or use this particular attack, but they might use this. They might, they might fish, but they might not use this uh, particular zero day or have access to one. So you focus your capabilities where it needs to be. But in cases where the ideal state is that you also include the capabilities, needs, and considerations of the user when you're developing those countermeasures. That's what I would consider to be the ideal state. Where you have multiple vulnerabilities, you take into account what the adversary can do, what are the needs and the risk appetite and the level of the user, and then you start to develop your countermeasures. And so when you do develop your countermeasures, there's some specific rules that I think we need to follow, at least for our audience, is it has to be easy to use so that an uneven level of technical skill can apply it if we can't physically be there with them, which is often the case. It needs to be free in, or inexpensive, very, very inexpensive, because frankly, they have better things to do with their money, whether it's an individual planning their escape that's going to need to be financially stable, or whether it's a shelter, safe house, or whatever else we may work with, they need their money elsewhere. So we're starting to really look at free and inexpensive uh, methods. It needs to be secure and it has to be hard to detect. When you put a countermeasure in place, you don't want to create new indicators. And we'll talk about that a little next, but I'll talk fast because I'm down like my next five minutes. And then you have to make the assumptions that the device is going to be searched, that if there's any changes, it'll be noticed, and that detection can be very dangerous. So a case in point that I'll run very quickly through is there's a form that a lot of the shelters use where it's a planning app, it's a, or a planning tool. I wrote app, I meant it's a page. And it's a really good idea because when you're suffering, when you're going through the scariest moment of your life, you might not be able to remember this person said they'd loan me money, this person's going to take me in for day one. You can't remember that because you're going through the stressful time. So writing it down theoretically is a fine idea. But then you look at it and the problem is, it says right on the bottom, hide it really well. How well can you really hide it? Because that's the keys to the kingdom. If the abuser were to find it, they say, oh, these are their allies, this is where they're going, these are the code words they're using. So we're looking at this problem by the request of someone we've been working with. And we say, this is dangerous if found, we need to find another way. So the solution is to digitize all the things. Uh, many people have a phone, and they can use that same capability on the phone, and they can say, well, okay, maybe I can hide a little bit, looks like I'm texting or things like that. But then you do kind of your iterative threat model, and you see, well, that creates new icons, new apps, new information, it's going to be found, what do you do next? You go through and you say, well, we we'll just put a password on it, encrypt it, so that uh, even if they find it, they can't access it. But that leads to the same problem, is that they'll ask for it, which apparently won't work on some people because they can say no to me when I ask nicely for the password, very nicely, and he said no. I just want to point that out. He took my pie. 
Um, so then you get to more of an ideal state where you can start to obfuscate uh, that information. You can try to maybe think that it looks like something else that it's not. And then you have something that's pretty good security. And that's a very general model. So what we came up with is this. I redacted it a little bit so that you might not recognize what the app looks like. But it is an app. Uh, it has a misleading title. It claims to do something that it doesn't actually do. Uh, but it's functional as a UI. It does have the feature that it pretends to have. And it's something that you may have on your phone without actually using it for any other purpose. So you have plausible deniability because you only log in for some certain functions uh, for if you're the intended use. So otherwise, there's a method that you can easily say, I don't have a password. I don't know why I'd have a password. I just like the other thing that it pretends to do, though not in those words. And you'll notice it has no password reset option. It has no password reset option because that is inherently dangerous, as we talked about. And it matches, kind of focuses on that. You can use, it's secure, it's available. You can use it on a different computer. If you lose it when the phone is left behind or taken or destroyed, then uh, you can install it onto the phone and have access to the same information. So it kind of meets that CIA triad and those other aspects as well. That was not, okay. So what you would tend to see, this is a really neat chart at one time, and it's gone, but it looked complicated, and I liked it for that reason. But what you tend to see is a very, very complex, convoluted flowchart process that involves different tools and different resources. You have to loop in law enforcement, support systems, and everything else. And it becomes very, very difficult, but it's transparent to the individual, and it needs to be transparent to the individual, where the assistance that is provided to them is behind the scenes. But you can narrow it down to four specific steps. First, you need to establish secure communications. They need to have a safe way to talk. And this is the point where you start putting these tools in place that they did not know existed, where they're saying, oh my gosh, I can talk to my sister again. I haven't talked to my brother or my mom in three years. I can do that again. Because they feel safe to do that. They understand the risk, what the risks are and how to overcome that. And then you work on developing the security measures, both for in the time frame of when they're going to escape and throughout that process as well. Um, sometimes they can't be done right away, so time increases risk. One of the scariest questions that I hear people convey to me is why the hell are you so damn happy? Because behaviors start to change and, they, and that can be detected by someone that is close to them. So that's where you really need to focus on all of those aspects. They need to have a safe destination to go to and that becomes an awareness piece. Sometimes you work at the shelters and the safe houses which are often not secure because they're run by people, well-meaning heroes in my mind, but often they're healthcare workers, they're former uh, social workers, things like that, not security people, and have not had the benefit of security people coming in and providing that assistance because they don't have money. And so the security companies don't really want to spend too much time with them, the resources aren't given to them, so having that done for free kind of helps them to protect those themselves and those that are entrusted to their care. And then you need to focus on security in perpetuity, which is meaning that they have to change their behaviors moving forward because once they leave, they're going to be looked at, so they need to look at uh, OSINT and OPSEC and all those other tools that they need to be considered. So a question, kind of summarizing everything up, is what can we do? We can be a mentor for those around us, uh, general knowledge, because we don't know who it is that's going to be going through this difficult time or who will go through this difficult time. So the more that we, the smart people in this room, on that side of the stage, because I'm just me, uh, is able to uh, share that information with those that are around them as far as basic security models, then that is going to make people more secure. And you may never find out why or how they needed it, but they're going to thank you. Someone in your life needs that information. Statistically, someone in your workplace, your community, needs that information and is not getting it. Uh, we need to be an advocate for people that can't speak for themselves to use your platforms. A lot of you have a lot of Twitter followers. A lot of you have a big voice. And the more you use that for this audience, the safer they're going to be, the more they can seek out help. And we want to reject past leg legacy past recovery methods uh, that deserved its own bullet point because those suck, and I hate those. Uh, because here's some common ones, right? Uh, mother's maiden name, we're familiar with these. These are how you reset your passwords. Mother's maiden name was first used to protect telegraph information and financials in 1882. It was adopted by the banking industry in 1906. And it made sense then because you didn't have the internet. You couldn't say, oh, I know their mother's maiden name. The idea, and this is codified in proceedings of these meetings where they said people don't know the other mother's maiden name in a, law, in a meeting far away, so if we ask them they'll be surprised and we can tell that they're a bad guy. That doesn't work anymore, but we're still using it. Lots of years later, we're still using it. Um, in fact, I mean, here's my information. Here, here are my answers, and you're welcome to copy those down or write them down if you want to, because like almost everyone else, I lie. Um, I lie a lot, and I never use my real information. This is all easy enough to find. But I lie when I don't use my password recovery options. But a lot of people don't 
think to do that because no one's telling them to do that. They're inherently honest and they're getting up there and they're saying, I need to give this real information. And so they're doing that and they're putting themselves at risk because their passwords can be easily reset with legacy old password recovery options. Does anyone here actually use their real information for password recovery options? Anyone brave enough to? Well, okay, if he says if we did what we tell you, no, I hope not. But at the same time, I'd imagine that a lot of you are liars like me, and uh, that's good. We should do that. But are we propagating? Is that a secret that we keep for ourselves? Is that a tactic that we use internally? Or is that something that actually we're sharing information? Um, when you develop security tools, at least keep in mind that the attacker might have physical access to the device. I'm not saying every tool has to have obfuscation and be this complicated method, but as much as possible, at least detect it. I mean, told to stop, so I'll say the last ones. Remember old school, steganography is still a thing. Codes are still an important thing. And know it when you see it. When someone comes to you and says this impossible thing is happening, let that be a red flag for you. When someone says, I'm seeing my uh, lights dim and I don't know why, don't call them crazy. Um, when someone is saying that things, are that things you know are impossible are happening, try to figure out why they think that's happening. Because sometimes when people come to you for technical help, as they all do, uh, all of us have a steady stream of people asking for technical advice, sometimes they're not asking about technical advice. Uh, so try to be aware of that happening. This is the part where I would ask for questions, but I don't have time for questions, but I will be around, available for the rest of the session, probably locked in handcuffs if I can't get out again. Um, I'd like to just add, I'd like to close off by saying Ann and Mike are fine. Uh, Francis here is fine as well. There's a lot of success stories, and there's more and more happening all the time. Um, but you can make more success stories in your community, your workplaces, and your circles, and I challenge you to do so as much as possible. Thank you very much for spending time with me.